Hi, Andrew here from Systemic Creative. We're here to talk about systems archetypes. Thanks for joining us. It is part of a series, so if you've seen this introduction 15 times before, do feel free to skip it, I won't be offended. At Systemic Creative, we are here to help organisations and businesses grow and develop, to be more productive, more effective and more resilient, but at the same time to have better well-being throughout, happier staff, happier teams and a happier, more positive organisation as a result. We look at the organisation as an organism and this is a paradigm which helps us to make leaps into how to change organisational dynamics for the better. It's a blend of systems dynamics, systems thinking, leadership, teamship and most importantly listenership. Now our organisational development programme has been described as groundbreaking, paradigm shifting and experiential reprogramming and radicalising the way that people work among other things. So do check out the links in the description below to our programme if that's of interest to yourself, your business or your organisation or community group or whatever. And of course do subscribe to our channel for more content. We also have some fun stuff on the channel as well, what the team get up to and some fun projects and things like that. So you can join us for those sorts of things as well. So we're here to talk today about systems archetypes. Now systems archetypes are part of the wider discipline of systems thinking, which is something which was pioneered really by Donella Meadows back in the 1970s with her release of a seminal work, Limits to Growth which is also the name of a systems archetype, which was the first and it's one that Donella Meadows came up with and articulated in the book. Now, I highly recommend Donella Meadows' work, for, particularly for people who are new to systems thinking. She's a great teacher and a brilliant thinker, so do look her up on the web. You'll find her on YouTube as well, so, so look into Donella Meadows. Well, systems archetypes are also called systems traps. And the reason for that is it's an archetypal set of system dynamics into which Almost any system can fall if you're not careful, particularly human systems. Organisations, businesses, community groups, anything that involves people can fall into these systems traps. And generally speaking, they are things that can be quite disruptive and that we would want to avoid. So in these talks, we'll look at each archetype. We'll describe the archetypal system dynamics. We'll look at some real world examples of it. We'll look at what the leverage points in the system are and Arguably most important, we'll look at how to avoid falling into those systems traps and if we're already in it, how we get out of it. We will assume a bit of systems language knowledge already, but we'll also do our best to describe things and how they work as we go through the talk. Okay, let's dive into today's talk. All right, limits to growth. Now, this is one of the original systems archetypes and this came out of a report done by Danella Meadows and her co-researchers, co-authors in 1972, uh, which was a computer simulation. It was from a computer simulation, I should say, which demonstrated the effects and subsequent negative repercussions of infinite economic growth and population growth on a finite planet. Uh, so that's where this came from. Uh, but we can apply this to our organisations, to our businesses and to our activities today very effectively. So first of all, before we do that, we're going to look at rabbits. Uh, who doesn't like a rabbit? So it makes it nice and simple, makes it easy to look at. So here we are, here we are in the beginning of the system. So we have a stock of rabbits. And what happens to rabbits if you leave them to their own devices? We all know what happens, don't they? They breed. So the rabbits breed and we have an increased stock of rabbits. Fairly self-explanatory now. This increased stock of rabbits needs to eat. It needs fuel, they need to survive, so they consume resources. And unsurprisingly, when a large stock of rabbits consumes resources and continues to be led to the left of their own devices, uh, they breed some more. And so we've got a reinforcing feedback loop here. And that's what the R means, it's a reinforcing feedback loop. And the plus there means that there's an increase in this activity here in this stock 
in the system here. Now you'll see these uh, systems archetypes drawn in various slightly different ways in different textbooks. Each systems thinker, if you will, brings their own interpretation to them. The way I draw them, I tend to try to make them as easy to understand by as many people as possible. Uh, so I have reinforcing and balancing feedback loops and also positives and negatives if I think that makes it easier to understand. So here we've got a stock of rabbits. Uh, the rabbits breed, they make a bigger stock of rabbits. Uh, they, they eat, they consume resources, and that just is an ever-increasing cycle. Except it's not an ever-increasing cycle, is it? Because at some point, if we assume these rabbits are in a limited space, there is a limit to the amount of food they can eat. There's a limit to the resource, and this limiting factor impinges upon their consumption. So, let's say this food runs out, and rabbits keep breeding, they keep breeding, reinforcing feedback loop. Uh, at some point the food runs out. Now what happens is rabbits die, unfortunately. So this leads to a balancing feedback loop here, the B for balancing. And uh, the minus sign there indicates that the rabbit stock, the rabbit population, is reduced. Now what happens obviously in the real world situation is we don't have a sudden, a sudden end of resources and a sudden dying off of the rabbits. Um, that can happen, uh, but here what happens is there's a steady decline in the resource and that means that some rabbits can't compete and they, they unfortunately die off. So this is the balancing feedback loop in this system. And so the system dynamics continue with this interplay of a, a reinforcing feedback loop here and a balancing feedback loop here. Now ideally these two feedback loops need to be in some sort of dynamic equilibrium. And what happens is the rabbit population gets to a certain amount and it, it roughly stays there. Some can't compete for resources, some can, and so uh, some breed, but some die off. But this is a limiting factor which is ever present. And when we consider this in relation to our modern activities in our businesses or in the world as a society as a whole, uh, we can start to see some potentially catastrophic consequences as we move through this process uh, and as we get to a finite limit of certain resources. Now we can obviously think of such things as mining fossil fuels, that's a good example of this system's archetype. At some point fossil fuels are going to run out and that will potentially leave us in a sticky situation if we haven't planned around it. Uh, but it needn't be so dramatic. So one example of this systems archetype at play in a typical business or an organisation will be the amount of skills and ability within the organisation. So if the organisation here is growing and it then needs skills and abilities in order to continue its growth. So it will need people who are able to undertake the specialist demands of the business, whatever that is. Let's, let's say, for example, it was a technology company uh, which produces high-tech products. It will need skilled people in order to assemble those products. It needs skilled people in order to research those products and develop them further. So in order to survive, it needs that, that bed of talent and it needs to increase. So we need to, it needs to recruit people and it needs to increase, increase that pool of talent within the organisation. Now it may be that there is a limit to the particular specialisms that the organisation needs. And if there isn't a plan for that, this could cause a real problem. If the organisation has planned a production line to produce, say, 100,000 units of X technical product, uh, but it only has enough people to produce 50,000 and it can't get the other people quickly enough, then we have a, a, a limits to growth situation. And what that's potentially catastrophic for the organisation because if it can't deliver on its promise, it potentially loses credibility, it potentially loses customers, and we're down into a bit of a sticky mess. Um, another real world example would be something I'm familiar with, something who's anybody who's studied uh, remotely, say an open university degree or that kind of thing. So you're doing that and you're also working to put food on the table and you've also got a family and you're looking after that your limiting factor there is time. So all of these things, the things that you're doing, your studies, your work and your family, and leisure time of course, consume the resource of time in your system. And there is a finite amount of time, and if you get to a limit of that, you increase stress level, you increase problems, you increase uh, your ability to actually undertake all of those things effectively and the quality of your family time and that kind of thing. So we need to be aware of this uh, systems trap 
and we need to understand how to avoid it. I promised we'd look at leverage points. So what are the leverage points here? You might want to pause the video and just have a think about what those leverage points are. So if we look at this, uh, the two points in this system where we can make a relatively small change to have a relatively large output, which is the definition of a leverage point, are the consumption of resources, the rate at which resources are consumed and the way in which they are consumed, and also the limiting factor itself. So what is the limiting factor? Are there, is there something we can do with it? Uh, is there some alternative that we can use in order to adapt the system? So how do we avoid it? So a key way to avoid this, and this was the purpose of the original report by Meadows et al in 72, was to, we need to understand the limits ahead of time. So if we're that technological organization and we are planning to produce 100,000 of our flagship technical product, we need to understand ahead of time how many people we might need to recruit, not only to produce that 100,000, but if consumer demand increases subsequently, how many people are we going to be able to get specialist uh, assemblers, specialist researchers, specialist workers to undertake the work required quickly enough in order to meet consumer demand and to maintain our, com our company reputation and to continue to grow as a result. So we need to think ahead and we need to understand those limits ahead of time. And one way to do that, of course, is having a plan, having a strategy and really thinking about what's going on. Good strategy, the key to, often the key to successful organisational planning. We can perhaps look for ways to reduce these limits. So we're approaching fossil fuel limits. We're approaching the end of fossil fuels. At some point that's going to happen. They're a finite factor. And people have been looking at ways to uh, reduce these limits. Now fracking is a very controversial way to potentially reduce that limit. So it's a way of extracting more fossil fuels, but there are potentially unintended consequences for doing that, which is always a risk in any system, the risk of unintended consequences. And we'll look at that in some other systems archetypes more deeply. Uh, but there may be ways to reduce these limits. There may be ways that we can actually find to obtain more of this stock. And we can also look for alternatives. So thinking about the fossil fuel example again, an alternative will be renewables. It might also be nuclear fusion. So these are alternatives to fossil fuels and we might be able to uh, use these to prevent the catastrophic effect of this system's archetype taking place. But of course, looking for alternatives and implementing the alternatives brings us back uh, to strategy and understanding the limits ahead of, ahead of time. Those are the key things we need to consider. Uh, because well, let's use the example of fossil fuels there. Nuclear fusion is certainly a potential alternative to fossil fuels, but nobody knows how to do it yet. We are making progress, but it's going to take decades probably to actually get that into a commercially viable solution. So we really need to be thinking ahead. Uh, and that speaks really uh, of the importance of systems thinking. We need to think in systems and we need to understand all of the systems to which the system of our organisation belongs and with which it interacts. So the talent pool within our organisation is dependent upon the talent pool outside of our organisation. So when we're thinking about that technological company expanding, or in fact any company expanding to do anything, we need to think about the system that is our organisation, but also the wider system with which it must interact in order for survival. And that's systems thinking. So that's why these systems archetypes are important. Thanks for watching this talk. Do check out the others in the series. We'll be going over lots of different systems archetypes and have a look out for those on YouTube. And check out the links to our organisational development programme as mentioned in the introduction. That contains lots about systems thinking, but also much, much more than that and how we can effectively interact uh, as systems, living systems at all levels. There are links to that in the description below and there's a little bit about it to come just following this talk. Thanks for watching.